All right, everyone. Welcome to Beyond Self-Discipline. Uh, this session will be exclusive to the Beyond Self-Discipline uh, cohort, uh, but the video might eventually be on the STOA's YouTube channel. Uh, so before we begin, I wanted to just check in with Daniel to see how his uh, goals and practices and negations are doing. Yeah, um, it's been a pretty intense start to the week. Um, I had a, a couple uh, intense fitness goals, so my, my body's very sore right now. Um, but it feels, I feel very supported. Um, and there's this interesting balance between kind of like, like hard, like disciplined focused focus, as well as this like soft kind of compassionate support that's happening in, in my, uh, group chat with my gang, which I'm really loving. I think they're both necessary, but I'm curious how it's going for you, Peter. Yeah. That same dynamics of sort of like just forgiveness look where you're at, not sort of uh, coming from a place of uh, pressure or judgment, but at the same time, like we're kind of crushing it too. Like we're hitting all our targets, um, good momentum. I feel a little bit tired today, uh, having a uh, one meal a day and that's sort of, um, you know, uh, it's got to catch up to that and get used to it, but it feels good. And I hope everyone else is gang is going well. Uh, so today we have a, a special session uh, we got the sense-making general himself, uh, Jordan Hall, with us uh, discussing the metacrisis as a forcing function for sovereignty. Um, and the reason why I invited journal, uh, Jordan in to, and chose this topic um, is like developing personal sovereignty or uh, minimal viable sovereignty or union of sovereign individuals, what is BSDs and is service towards. I think something's very important to be aware of what's at stake. Uh, the existential risks, the suffering risks, uh, the complexity that is the meta crisis, it imbues a certain gravitas, uh, I find. Um, so cleaning up your room is not just about you making your room look nice. Uh, it's connected to the, the wider picture. Uh, so how today's going to work uh, for the first 60 minutes, uh, it'll be a conversation uh, with Jordan. Then after the 60 minute mark, uh, we'll start, oh, we'll stop the record button. Daniel will have to leave at that point. Jordan can slip out and anyone else who has to leave uh, can go. Uh, but for the rest of us, we'll go on a bio break and then we'll engage in a 30 minute conversation uh, about what was spoken about today and how we can apply it to the BSD experience. Um, that being said, I'll tag in Daniel now and uh, he'll start his dialogos with Jordan. If you have questions anytime, just put in the chat and then we'll call on you. You can unmute yourself. You can ask your question to, to Jordan or just share your thoughts with the group. So Daniel, you're up. Cool. So Jordan, we titled this session. Oh, I, I muted you, Daniel. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um, so Jordan, we entitled this session, The Meta Crisis as a Forcing Function for Sovereignty. And I thought it would just be good to start with a couple definitions. So what is your latest definition of sovereignty? We got to unmute Jordan as well. Hmm, interesting. I had to give permission to Peter giving permission to me being unmuted. It's, uh, Zoom is becoming very consent based. Um, it hasn't changed actually in quite some time, uh, but I think the, the nuance is a little bit tricky. And I think there's a very nice way of walking in from something like sovereignty into uh, virtue. So I'd like to just kind of put that out there. Uh, the first point is something like uh, it's contextual. So we can say that in the context of, for example, um, skateboarding, Tony Hawk is substantially more sovereign than I am. Right? This has to do with his holistic competency in the context to select choices and effectuate those choices so as to further a possibility of his next step. Right. That's the notion. Right. The notion is you're always in a continuous process of being in relationship with your context. And the challenge is, can you dispose of yourself? Can you coordinate a set of choices and effectuate them in the world such that your next context is have broader, more open field of possibility? Right. That's, the, that's the, the essence of it. And then what we can notice is that we can say, okay, in its most fundamental sense, it's intrinsically bound to context. And also, we can speak about the generality of it. So the more uh, sets of contexts, 
uh, in which one can maintain a certain level of sovereignty, particularly above the threshold of uh, reciprocal closing. Right? So if we say that there's a particular line of sovereignty where reciprocal closing becomes the dominant force. For example, I have, I'm going to shift from skateboarding to surfboarding because my sovereignty in skateboarding is quite poor. Um, if I've reached that very particular point in surfing where I'm no longer on my board, or I have, I'm not yet obviously fallen off, but it's the point the crush threshold is crossed, I'm going to draw that as a particular line. So that line is the reciprocal closing is now the dominant attractor in the system. I can say, can I generalize across all possible contexts? Right? So a capital S sovereign would be able to achieve this notion of contextually bound sovereignty above that minimum threshold across all possible contexts, which of course is a, an abstraction, right? There's no being other than perhaps being, capital B, um, that could achieve that, but that gives us an orienting basis of what it would look like. And, that, and now we're in the complexity of just life. Um, where do you choose to allocate your time and energy in the sense of which contexts do you perceive as the ones that are most meaningful in your sort of upcoming, con you know, as you're encountering context, are you, for example, spending your time training your capacity in surfing when in fact, you should have trained your capacity in growing food, for example. So that you get to different levels of meta in terms of how you actually even begin the process of engaging which allocations of capacity building. You know, so you can notice there's a lot of complexity in this concept, but once you get the basic ideas, you can see that it's um, in some sense very simple. And then, you know, um, because of the nature of the reality is complex, there's a complexity of how it plays out in reality. So uh, there, there's two things that come to mind when hearing that. The first is a quote by Forrest Landry, where, um, and he's riffed on this in a few ways, but the quote that comes to mind is, love is that which enables choice. And of, often the optimal choice is the choice that increases your choice making across time. And I feel like, you know, you said a lot there, but the way that I'm parsing it out is, is within that quote. Would you say that's accurate? Yes. And so that goes to the second thing which you said in the beginning that you think there's a, a nice way to tie this into virtue um so i'd, lo I'd love to hear you uh do that and see if you can tie it into the concept of love as well yeah i would i would say it seems to me pretty 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 straightforward um if you imagine um over a very long period of time evolving organisms are inevitably engaging with a variety of contexts in each case endeavoring to resolve the question of how to achieve sovereignty. And this is, a, this is a, a general question, it's not a human question. And particular capacities, particular dispositions, and in particular, particular bases of choice have a certain conservation law. Right? They show up as being almost always or quite often um, the best, right? the ones that if you have these as part of your basic operating system, you're going to show up as having sovereignty in your, in your experience. And so I would say that the virtues are that sort of thing, right? They are hard learned, um, almost like discovered geometries in sovereignty space, that if we orient ourselves towards them, we get the benefit of all those who have come before us to simplify our task of navigating the complex space of sovereignty. And then as Forrest points out, the Urheimat, right, the most foundational, most generalizable is the basis of love, meaning all virtues are ultimately grounded in that as, the, as their basis from which they come. How would you define love in that context? <laughs> well, you already said it. Love is that which enables choice. And so what I'm getting from that is if there's some sort of driving function behind what we're doing here you know we're a bunch of people here trying to cultivate sovereignty um we are we are trying to increase our capacity to make choices i feel like there's something missing there can I, maybe some tools. Mm -hmm. uh, one tool, proper order. Proper order in relationship between uh, meaning and the way that we describe meaning. You know, so if I say 
love is that which enables choice, many people will endeavor to do something like work backwards from their pre-existing semantic framework that they've attached to the notion love. So they do like a definitional mapping. Wait, I've got this cluster of notions that describe this phenomenon. How do I try to do a translation mapping between that and this other set of words here? I would propose that is not proper order. Proper order would be something like remembering or bringing oneself into the first person experience, particular moments, and ideally a diversity of moments, a multiplicity of moments where the thing that is named love shows up and begin to notice at the level of experience, not at the level of semantics, what is the thing we're talking about. And then from that, getting a fully embodied large system sensibility of what it is we're talking about, and then begin to use that as the way of doing the, ah, here's what the words have been talking about. Right? So in that direction. And then same thing there, right? the notion of choice is not obvious. Mm -hmm. We have uh, the way I've been describing it to my wife is we, we've been living a very long time in upside down land and, or maybe inside out land. And so oftentimes our our notions of what things are, are in fact very distinctly not what they actually are. Right? For example, there's a big ambiguity in our, in many people's minds between the notion of selection and the notion of choice. Yeah? And I would propose that those are not the same thing. In fact, they are almost perfectly opposite. To make a selection from a menu, for example, um, is not choice. Choice is precisely unbound by a pre-existing domain. So if we begin to think about what is this thing we're calling choice, you know, Forrest also says something like, it's more proper to say that choice has self than that selves make choices. You know, already with that, our, that way of framing it really exposes topsy-turvy land. So maybe that tool will help. So, Based on that, how should we think about the choices that we have in a given day? And I'll tell you where this is coming from. I've heard you uh, speak before um, in different contexts about the importance of our decisions. And I, this, what you did right now as well, just kind of reframing things and uh, disabusing us of some of the baggage we have with our words all of a sudden like locked me in a little bit into the, the moment and made me realize like, oh, actually this day is significant. You know, even though it's a Wednesday and I have to get back to work after this and there's all these mundane things, it just kind of shifted everything and made me realize, okay, there's a space here that's very significant that I keep forgetting and I need to be reminded of. And so the question I'm trying to, I'm searching for is um, how do I take that deeper uh, definition of choice um, and keep that salient to me throughout my daily life and realize that what I do actually matters, which is, I think, what you're implying and in, in what you're saying. Yeah, that's very nice. Um, you know, this notion of significance and the notion of mundane, which, by the way, links very no nicely to the notions of sacred and profane. Um, one might say that the, the thing that one is endeavoring to do is to live fully and always in the sacred and to enact the sacred in relationship with the sacred and that that is always present to recognize the infinite significance that is omnipresent might be a way of pointing towards it and then to recognize precisely the, the very specific thing you're bringing up hmm, how do i say this not the banal but the actual deeply profound oh it turns out that i'm constantly finding myself in a circumstance of inappropriately forgetting the significance of the moment that I am in and projecting <laughs> what would just happen. Someone was off me. I think we're gonna have And inappropriately projecting the notion of significance on a reification of experience. Does that make sense? I don't, I don't know if I understood that last bit. Maybe try yeah, that. Let me see it in a slightly different way. Um, yesterday, I was at a, I was having brunch with my wife. And she mentioned an experience or a, a common form of experience that she finds herself in where she isn't even aware 
of the environment, the experience, the, 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 the reality she's in. She's in her head. That's a pretty common phrase. She's in her head. And her body is moving through space time and stuff is going on, but she's in her head. And what this does is this creates a very interesting separation that, that implies that experience isn't significant unless it has been imbued with significance by mind. Mind goes, oh, no, 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 that's significant. I'm, or, I'm responsible for orienting your attention towards that which is significant. So I'm going to withdraw significance from experience, from the moment, and then I will, I will construct a mechanism whereby I will then imbue experience back into the world. Uh, this is, Nietzsche pointed this out very specifically. Um, and the proposition I'm making is something like the exact inverse, which is to notice that significance is intrinsic and that the challenge is in fact how to go about increasing the significance. Right? So it's not like a one zero process, it's actually a, a one plus. How do I engage in the world so as to increase the richness and quality and complexity of experience to increase the significance of my environment. And, and this, by the way, loops us all the way back into a very interesting way of thinking about the notion of sovereignty, right? And you know, we're starting to hit this thing from different directions. To live artfully, right? We can bring in the notion of art, for example, um, which is to say, to form clarity and coherence and intensity in the diversity of the field of choices that we express into the world. That's to live artfully. Very interesting. Yeah, my, my mind immediately goes to... One, one moment, one, one second, I apologize. You just got paused by the general, uh, Daniel. It gives me a second. Sorry, <laughs> Daniel. Right, my, um, my family is just right over there and there's a door that was open. And uh, I was noticing my attention was getting split. I don't want that. Oh, no problem. Um, yeah, I guess the, the question that comes up for me is if, um, I don't know how you put it exactly, but if the moment is already significant, why is it? such a challenge to always be aware of that. And in my mind, I start to go to something else you said earlier about how we've been living in upside down land for, for so long. So perhaps that's related, but yeah, that's, that's my next question. Well, this is what, this is what um, the way I've made sense of that question. Um, let's just take school. I remember a very specific experience when I was in first grade, nearing the end of first grade. We were sitting probably at the day, at, the, at those times we call it Indian style. I think they now call it crisscross applesauce um, on the floor before the teacher. And this isn't exactly how the teacher conveyed it nor how I experienced it, but it's the essence, the feeling of it, which was something like, listen up, first grade, I get it. Sort of weird and kind of a waste of time, but here's the reason. Second grade is for real, like, mm -hmm. There's no more larking about, man. When you get to second grade, shit is going to hit the fan. We're trying to get you guys tightened up so you can go to town with second grade. All right. And I remember as a first grader having the very specific inquiry of going, okay, well, why is that? Like, is second grade setting me up for third grade? Like, at that level, already beginning, this is part of upside down land. You know, the notion of extracting the meaningfulness in the moment and projecting it as meaningful in service to a moment in the future. I am in preparation for the moment in the future. That's where meaning lives. Meaning lives in some point in the future where the thing that now is being preparing me for, right? That's a very, okay, why? Why is this the case? I'll give you an example. Rote learning. This much of what we're talking about has to do with an alienation of naturalness in service of optimization uh, structures. Right? There's a notion of, I want to be able to optimize, for example, in this case, learning for some set of particulars. In order to accomplish that optimization, 
I need to provide a, a, an incentive structure, a motivation structure, and ultimately a sensing structure that is uh, not in alignment with or not ordinarily part of nature. I'm going to be doing some sort of super salient concentration of attention. And to do that, I'm beginning to, I'm going to move the body and the mind away from naturalness towards some particular, in this case, top-down or external imposed set of optimizations. No, I get it. It's a beautiful day outside and you want to go play, but you're going to sit here and focus on repeating, draw, writing three plus three equals six, 600 times on a piece of paper. Right? There's an absurdity to that that is the profound first person experience of every, every human being who's experienced with the possible exception of people who are deeply OCD. Um, that absurdity, that feeling of absurdity and wrongness, that's the kind of wedge that is the essence of topsy-turvy land. And that separation from naturalness is precisely the separation of meaningfulness from experience, right? I'm being alienated from my own integrity, from my own basic sense of how to make choices in the world, right? My natural evolved, right, over billions of years, evolved sense of how to navigate the environment the nature of how virtues arose in the first place, I'm being alienated from that and, and forced to not honor my own sense of what is the right way to make choices and not, by the way, to suffer the consequences of my own choices and learn first person the complex reality of, that I'm operating in, but rather to begin to map against a very artificial and therefore quite overly simple, complicated in, uh, motivation structure, which is beginning the process of effectively turning me into a machine. And so it's the, the separation from agency, from choice into selection, which begins the process of making us very confused about how to navigate through significance. So I got a couple more questions and then maybe I'll, I'll tag Peter in. Um, but I, that beautifully touches on a theme that we've been trying to address in Beyond Self-Discipline, which is there's a bunch of things that we know are good for us to do um, that are the part of ourselves that we trust the most tells us to do. But for whatever reason, we find it very difficult to do. And so big question, which I, I think you're kind of answered in a way is why is it so hard to do the things that we know we should do that are, are good for us to do and that we benefit from doing. And I think what I'm getting from what you're saying is that it's because we've been alienated from what's natural for so long. And you also said we've been alienated from our integrity. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, well, there's three things. I mean, the third is important. So let me, let me go through them. You, you mentioned the first two. So let me just ping again. Um, we have been separated from our, our complex capacity to make sense of the world and to make effective choices in the world. And so we have that ambient capacity, which is naturalness, we've in fact been separated from it, which means of course that we also haven't been exercising it. We haven't gotten competent at it, right? It, we, have, we have an ambient capacity, but that doesn't mean that we're naturally good at making effective choices in real complexity. And you're not born being able to juggle. You're born with the capacity to learn how to juggle, right? But if you don't actually experience it, you haven't built that capacity. So we've been separated from that and it is ameliorated and it's been replaced with a giant universe of extremely bad habits. <laughs> so we're not only do we have, uh, have we lost access to the natural capacity to engage in learning and building complex capacity, we also have to unwind a enormous number of bad habits. Right? But then the third, the third is that Homo sapiens is the animal that separates its own environment from the environment for which it was well suited. Mm. Right? So this is a problem. And part of what we are doing when we are enculturating is endeavoring to say, whoa, guys, look, here's the deal. Hand grenades are not part of our natural environment. And the, the one for which Homo sapiens was initially involved, uh, evolved. And if, we, if children explore their space in the way that natural Homo sapiens explore their space, and the space happens to have a hand grenade, they're going to be able to blow themselves up almost every time, right? I don't know if you've ever seen the way a two-year-old explores space, but a, a little hand-sized object that has a ring in it, that shit's getting pulled, 
every time. Right? So, oh, wait, we've essentially toxified our own environment with super salient, super intense, asymmetric artifacts, i.e. technology, for which we are in fact not well suited. Right? So now we have a real problem. Culture is this interesting um, band-aid. You know, this enculturation or education is an effort to figure out how to train humans to accelerate their learning capacity beyond or outside of the boundaries of what the field of naturalness would provide in the context of the fact that we're actually constantly producing, I'm gonna call them toxic, and for a specific set technology is toxic, but I mean this in the particular sense, that they are super salient, highly intense, and, uh, and hold a level of uh, disruptive or uh, discontinuous potential. Um, so we're in a bit of a bind. And we can't just, there's no sort of going back to a, or giving up on, there's a, whoa, we need to actually figure out how to step to another level. And I think that's the, maybe the essence of this conversation. Yeah, and I think that's a good segue into my next question, which is given, given everything you said, um, it seems like we're, yeah, as you said, we're in a bind. And this term that's been thrown around a lot is the meta crisis um, to represent all the multivariate things that are uh, leading to this discontinuity. And so I'm wondering, um, how do you define meta crisis? Hmm. Yeah, I've been thinking about this. Um, so first order, I learned the term from uh, uh, Bjorkman, Thomas Bjorkman, in dialogue, not in reading. But I like the term um, because one might use the term to mean something like omni-crisis. Uh, so there's a flatness to omni-crisis. Oh, there's lots of crises that are happening. It's not just one, there's many. But the notion of meta implies verticality, depth, nesting. In my way of geometry, I tend to go down rather than up. So I'll be speaking down. Many people's basic sense of meta implies up, but just assume that it's basically the same thing here. The implication of the meta crisis is that for us to examine or understand what's happening, we have to actually go into deeper and deeper levels of how things show up. And so there's not a, a crisis in say, I don't know, finance. It has to do with the nature of institutions and money, you know, a, a, a more profound level. But it's not even a crisis, the level of the nature of institutions and money. It actually has to do with what is the essence of institution in general and the essence of money in general right? and how do humans engage in behavior in general right? the magnitude of the crisis that we're dealing with is exposing um, fracture points in the nature of the world that we are living in human technology nature that are, are deeply profound and we can't address the crisis at the superficial level, and what well, we can, but we'll, that'll make things worse. Um, so we can't properly address the crisis at the superficial level. And there's an inquiry of, okay, what is the level of depth we need to get to, to at least in principle, be grasping the problem appropriately so that we can begin to endeavor to actually respond to it effectively. That's what that means to me. Mm -hmm. um, that's making me think that maybe there's a meta crisis of virtue because I don't know at least right now, I don't know what a deeper level of that would be at the level of the individual. Um, and I guess uh, my last question then is, how can we use the position that we're in? So the title of this talk, how can we use this meta crisis as a forcing function to cultivate sovereignty or virtue? Okay. Hmm. Did you ever see the movie Arrival? Yeah, it's one of my favorite. Awesome, yeah, me too. In fact, I think I've identified it as my favorite. You know how that works. Like, hmm. For now, I'm going to call that my favorite. I've done that too. So there's, there's a scene where they first are going, where our hero is first going into the ship. And there's a, you know, a lift, and she's going up, 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 up. And then somebody throws one of those uh, uh, lights, and it goes in the ordinary gravity, and then suddenly it falls effectively sideways. And what you realize is that in that particular context, gravity doesn't behave the way that we ordinarily think it does. There's a point where you go, and there's some threshold where it's actually zero gravity, and there's a new domain where gravity has a different directionality. <laughs> Sorry, I'm bringing that up because I think that's actually the proper metaphor for where we are. Um, 
you know, I mentioned that a, a very nice way of grasping virtue is as a sort of conservation or a, a discovery by means of evolutionary process of an intrinsic geometry of the choice-making landscape. Did that land? Mm -hmm. You can imagine sort of a, a being that has no eyes, no sight, just exploring its terrain and literally exploring it by physically walking around or feeling. Kinesthetic. That's how it works. And that's what virtue thus far has been. Um, and the very simple example, right? Those, those who do not have adequate courage or adequate temperance and whatever that means, like we can think about it literally at the level of like a paramecium, if we'd like, um, don't make it. And there's enough iterations of that process that you begin to get this increasingly uh, sort of fine grained sense of the, of the shape of this object, courage, okay. That's the elevator going up. So the evolutionary process has a gravitational directionality that has been defining how and what forever. Literally, literally since the beginning of the space time. But humans seem to have this particular capacity which appears to be unique to <laughs> arch it up. <laughs> Right, to create in this other space, right, this virtual imaginal space, the newosphere, new possibilities, which shifts the ground of the space that you're operating in. Right? That's what we're talking about. We've broken the, the evolutionary context. That's reaching the top of that lift where suddenly gravity goes to zero. We're now floating in this liminal space where the legacy model, the legacy approach of evolutionary process to navigate the space of possibility to discover the geometry of the choice making landscape no longer works because we're actually decoupling the nation of how evolutionary fitness operates, right? We can be very simple. Um, dentistry, now broadly ap applied, has enabled um, genotypes that otherwise would have died to be passed on. We've put a technology in place that has literally meaningfully changed the evolutionary landscape. It's a very simple example. But generalize that against all behavior. Okay, now, what's the other direction? Right? The enemy's gate is down. What is down? How do we identify down now that the process of evolutionary selection is no longer providing us with directionality and choice making? How do we orient ourselves on this new basis? Ah, well, that's the question. And right? that's the thing we're trying to explore. The answer to that question must be found in the novelty of what it means to be human in the first place. Because we brought, we opened the question space. Right? The fact that we're at this threshold is because of something about the nature of our capacity to enter into this newosphere, this virtuality, reach into the underlying code of nature and change it according to our own perspectives and intentionalities. So the challenge is to figure out how to operate. Now I'm going to issue a phrase that is relatively banal, but we can begin to unpack it, of conscious evolution. Right? The, the awareness, the actual use of awareness, right? this conversation, we are not merely hmm, discovering virtue by evolutionary process. We're discovering the ability to be aware of that fact. Ah, interesting. So how can we use this toolkit of awareness? this virtual space of newospheric collaboration to do a completely different thing around how we search the space of the choice-making landscape. And in this case, we can begin to do a lot of very interesting things. What does the mind do? Let's take an example. Hmm, this is a very nice example. So for about, how long was it? Let's just go with a very long time. Um, hominids were uh, cranking away on making hand axes, those little you know, rocks that were somewhat sharp. Very specific techniques for making them slightly sharper, that kind of thing. Long time, like a million years, really long time. Not a whole lot of progress. Right? Because, hey, this is better than nothing and stuck. And then there was a, and hand axes became nuclear weapons effectively instantaneously. What happened? Well, what happened was sharpness the ability to grasp a concept. What am I looking for here? Sharpness that is mechanistically independent. 
right? The sharpness is not inherent in the object in my hand. The sharpness is some kind of principle that I can begin to look for how to achieve that principle bound by the mechanism of what I have in my hand, but now the mechanism and the principle are actually being able to be separated. Um, in some sense, I can invoke Plato, right? but I don't want to be too structurally bound to that. But just this notion of, hmm, I can think about principles, concepts, separate from their particulars. And I can begin to think about how I might achieve um, performance in the principal domain. So I can think, well, what are the characteristics that give rise to sharpness? What are the techniques that increase the quality of my ability to get to sharpness? Right? That's what you can do. That's what we can do. All right. Apply that to virtue. We now can say, what is virtue? All right, how do I figure out how to hold this notion and be able to do the thing that evolutionary process did over a very long period of time, accomplish a higher quality performance using neurospheric collaboration to achieve a incredibly fine grained, what is it called? How does John speak of this? Mm, grip, optimal grip. Optimal grip on the actual geometry of objective reality in the field of choice and flip a whole new basis. Right? We are now beginning to operate in navigating ethics, navigating virtue on the basis of conscious awareness. Uh, and I would say that, that is the thing, that's where we're at. That's what's up, that's what's going on. That is at the absolute core of the meta crisis, deep as you can go. Beautiful. Well, on that note, I'll hand it over to Peter to uh, field any questions. Awesome. Yeah, awesome exchange, full circle. Um, let's uh, get some other voices in here. Uh, so anything that was said that, that came alive for you or anything related to the BSD experience, feel free to put in the chat. Um, and let's go with Lily first. I really like her question. If you can unmute yourself and ask it to Jordan. Are you there, Lily? I'm here, yeah. So you're asking, so if I have a question or? You had a question in the chat. Uh, was that to Jordan or? Yeah, I guess I'm just, I am really interested in, um, I don't know, yeah, sort of relating a lot of this to romanticism particularly um, and the way that like, it's sort of the question or the theme of receptivity in a way. Um, you know, in some ways it seems like sovereignty allows us to be open to the inherent meaningfulness of the world, um, or rather sovereignty relies on that. Um, so in other words, like being receptive um, is a key aspect of sovereignty. Um, and I'm just curious, yeah, like uh, Laura was talking about being, you know, returning to naturalness, um, returning to that like natural receptivity maybe to the world. But um, yeah, how on earth can you do that? <laughs> I mean, what are almost maybe practices or, yeah, like, um, yeah, how do we? Okay, um, well, here's one. Um, <laughs> I love how this is actually like, uh, well, it's in the frame of what Peter mentioned. You know, this is very sort of personal, very practical. Um, my wife invited me into a course called Learning to Feel, uh, Diane Musho Hamilton. Uh, this is an example, good course. Uh, very precise, very mature. She's been doing this for a long time. She's very aware. Um, and, you know, it just speaks to, to, the, to the basics of noticing how you built, let's call it scar tissue, um, or um, hmm, like reroutings of your receptivity systems that uh, inhibit your capacity to feel. And receptivity and feeling, right, very effectively the same, very closely related. And there's something like a, this particular pre, uh, course uh, investigates how in a very orderly practical way do we go about uh, reawakening the sort of the membrane, the sensing capacity um, in, in quality and in, in, in nuance and subtlety and also capacity to receive intensity um, to thereby you know, expand the manifold of our ability to be in relationship with the significance of reality. So, and so more basically, we help each other. You know, each and every one of us encounters that challenge. And when we think we have uh, extracted a certain level of wisdom, we endeavor to share that level of wisdom with increasing clarity, 
um, and with, and of course, and always with a, you know, from the orienting basis of love, which is say with good faith. Any follow-up thoughts or shares, Lily? I love that. Um, that's really interesting. And can you give me the name of the course again? Uh, Learning to Feel. Learning to Feel. And uh, Diane Hamilton. That's wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Laura, uh, you had a few questions. If you could ask one. Hi, hi, Jordan. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, yeah, I have a bunch of questions, so maybe I'll just ask my first one. But I'm really interested in the um, the way in which we become aware of choices that are always available to us that are otherwise obscured by our habits or by limitations of imagination. Um, yeah, I just wondered if you could speak to that. Yeah. Um... seems to me that the like, two really nice, simple steps, one is the question that was just asked. Right? So one goes to reawakening our receptivity. Right? And in the context of reawakening, of course, as we be, the practices of reawakening also become the practices of kind of expanding and attuning. And so we're not just polishing and cleaning the lens, we're actually now beginning to expand. And so one piece of that, and there's a whole set of practices along those lines many of which are uh, ameliorative, uh, repair, heal. And then as we do move past the ameliorative, we begin to expand into the uh, capacity building. The other piece would have to do with habits, bad habits and good habits. You know, as I said, we've, we've sort of been loaded with an enormous, and it's truly astounding, the enormity of the bad habits we've been loaded with um, for a wide variety of reasons, right? If you just think about the, like makes take a, a visual metaphor of a still pond which is say humanness, naturalness. And then um, let's say that the, the agricultural revolution is a, a dropping of a, of a meteorite out of space into that still pond, creating enormous you know, upwellings and shifts and ripples. Uh, but of course the meteorite broke up in space and they keep peppering down and all the waves that come out, they bring more energy in. So the past, whatever, 50,000 years, and it's been an extremely intense disruption of naturalness and has built layer after layer after layer of bad habit, which trauma, bad habit, same notion. Um, so a lot of work to be done. And hmm, here's a simple example. I experienced this all the live long day. It's really amazing. Um, I'll notice something comes up in my sensing, some notion like, hmm. to give a very simple example, I'll make, a, I'll make it a sort of a banal example. Um, did I turn off the gas on the stove, like 1950s, you know? And then some part of my mind will shut down that noticing and it'll just disappear. And I'll go on with my life. And then I'll have made some significant error. In this case, I burned down the house. Um, as opposed to a habit of slowness. Right? Just a general habit of spaciousness. A habit of literally learning how to remove the busyness that has been so deeply encoded into our interior and exterior environment that gives spaciousness to the wholeness of ourself. So when these things come up, we don't actually shut them up. <laughs> right? But I say, hey. Stop that, I gotta stay focused because things are crazy. But actually, okay, use subtle notions and sensings. There's something honorable happening here. How do I be able to listen? Right? But the habit is the habit of slowness, the habit of spaciousness, which is not at all easy, right? By the way, hmm, this may not be obvious, but when I say habit and I say we, the notion of we for me is expansive and so, hmm like all of humanity is we, and also a particular population in the city is we, and also my body is we, right? So the habit of busyness that is modern civilization is a habit that we have. Does that make sense? So I'm, I'm shifting the notion of like society and structure 
to the notion of people and habits. Right? And we generate, you know, my habit of busyness creates a ripple effect that produces an implication of your habit of noise, your experience of noise. If I'm busy, if I produce um, hmm, an irresponsible set of expressions into the environment, one of the consequences is I'm now generating ripples in everybody else's experience. And then if you are receiving those ripples in a way that causes you to come off of your equilibrium and your sovereignty, and you begin to now produce um, reactive ripples back into the environment, we are creating this space of noise and busyness that moves us out of spaciousness. So there's a, a question or challenge of how do we go about building better habits is of course, uh, as above, so below. It's a you know, fractal continuum from the microcosmos of the interior of the soul to the macrocosmos of the full limits of the human family. Any uh, follow-up thoughts or shares, Laura? Yeah, just to, um, yeah, thank you. I, I really like the sense of um, the kind of communal habit world that we've created, the kind of, um, and the dynamics that we perpetuate with one another, that feels very true to me. I guess as you were speaking, I was just wondering, um, given the immensity of the situation, given the like long ancestral chains of these kind of habits of trauma or um, capitalism or whatever it is, um, how do you how do you not get overwhelmed or feel some kind of you know despair? Or, like how what where is the root of your hopefulness or your sense of possibility for um, us to be otherwise? Hmm. I would actually say it slightly differently. Um, I do get overwhelmed and I feel despair. So the question is more like, how do you come back? <laughs> how do you step back into uh, the game? Which is to say, how do you reconnect with love as a basis of choice? And then once again, once again, you know, every breath, every moment, every day, from my experience, hmm, it's like gaps or, or, or sunny days in a cloudy, you know, sun, sunshine in a cloudy day. That there are periods of time where, um, how would I say, mm, let's go with despair or, or ultimately, ultimately something like fear and sadness are the dominant tone. And, and then there are times when, when love is the dominant tone. So the question is, how does one come back? How do you get breathed back in and settle and go, okay, whew, yeah, this is a rough, rough thing. Um, three-year-olds are three-year-olds are helpful. Kids are real helpful. You know, a kid feels. She falls. It hurts. She really cries, and then she stops because she's you know the emotion has happened. It's passed and it's gone. Right. One of the bad habits we have is we hold. Right? We try to control the emotional state, and in so doing, don't actually allow the process of being able to reestablish baseline reality. So that's one, really feel it. Just allow yourself to feel, don't be attached to the feelings, let the feelings flow through. Notice that they're telling you something real about reality and also don't imply other things, for example. <laughs> By the way, again, this is not, um, okay, I'm not up here speaking down. This is, we're in the middle <laughs> of it. Uh, like a lesson my wife was reminding me of literally yesterday and probably will again in about an hour. So that's one. What is the other? Oh, and then building capacity. You know, there, there is a, a sense of being able to remember. I think remembering and honoring the reality that learning has actually happened. It's very helpful to me at least. Oh man, oh boy. This feels like it's never gonna work. Like this just failure in every direction, absolute impossibility. Oh wait, there actually has been progress. There's capacity building, learning. The one who is here now um, would be experienced by the one who was here five years ago as having built greater virtue, greater capacity, greater wisdom, more ability to be, you know, more sovereignty. And so that, that reminding of, oh yeah, okay, you know, forgiving self for not being perfect and reminding self the self is actually growing, for me at least, ends up being a very basic, like very much at the bottom of how to continue to just sort of be on the path. Can I put one more? One more. 
um, uh, my, my, I would say friend, but certainly an indiv individual who I respect, Tyson Yonkapurta, um, has many times mentioned the necessity of thinking in long terms. And I think he says a thousand generations. It kind of takes a little bit of the load off. You know, we're, we're not here to fix the problem. There's no way that's going to happen. We're here to move in the right direction. And the more we can move in the right direction, the better. But that, and by the way, the other side of it is where we realize that you're going to die and the world is still going to be a serious mess. And we're definitely planting trees that we will never sit in the shade of. Okay, that's what's happening. Awesome. So beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, perhaps we can do one or two more questions. Uh, Justin, you had a question about Jordan's personal sovereignty frontiers, which uh, I think would be a good question to ask today. Mm -hmm. Jim, yeah. Hello. Uh, one of the things that I like about Peter is he's always been very upfront about his challenges. Right? He's a galaxy brain, but he also isn't afraid to get into his weaknesses and where he's really being challenged. And I'm curious, where are your sovereignty frontiers? Where are you and as much as you feel comfortable sharing that, because right now we're all trying to figure out what are the bad habits we should stop and what are the good habits we should try. Where are you on that continuum? Hmm. Well, so sure. What I'm going to try to do is figure out how to share something that's actually helpful. And the, the list is very long and um, intense. Well, you know, one thing that it seems like it's very pointed is, uh, well, I don't know if, it, if it's common knowledge. So in my biography, um, I had two daughters, call it 19 years ago, almost exactly, but a little bit longer than that. One daughter and then another, but in that time. And so when I was 30, and, and now I have another daughter and I'm 50. So I'm going through this process of being a parent as a different kind of person and interacting with a child and interacting with the consequences of having a child in the context of my relationship with my wife. Well, if you've ever been a parent, uh, that is what one might call a, uh, what is it, a sovereignty landscape? All kinds of very significant, chunky stuff, you know, deep stuff, like uh, how does my notable, what is this called? What is avoidance uh, strategy and attachment or my attachment disorder and my avoidance strategy and attachment disorder show up in the contents, context of the breaking up of habits that were useful, effective, and helpful in the context of a uh, couple that no longer show up as working in the context of a family. You know, my, my daughter, which I think is, by the way, the case with all children, one of her things is she is acting as a bit of a, uh, not even a sledgehammer, like a little micro jackhammer, fracturing all pre-existing assumptions and habits in our relationship and kind of forcing them back into a liminal space. So my wife and I had built up a lot of good stuff, like say having sex, which was a very useful way to maintain things like feeling connected, but our daughter is very significantly inhibited <laughs> in a somewhat hilarious level. Like literally she will get uh, physically in, interpose herself between us if we even try to hug, right? Which generates then sort of a sense of, well, one, it ameliorates the whole possibility landscape of, of um, you know, physical contact and touch. It isn't eliminated, but it reduces it substantially, which then raises up a whole bunch of other stuff that's happening at literally the hominid level and no existing habit structure to respond to, which then begins to expose aspects of the deeper interior self, which been sort of reactivated a whole new cycle of, um, you know, in this case, attachment, poor attachment cycling into sadness and despair and narrative. Right? So that's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, 
what was the other side? Oh, and then this really interesting dynamic of my daughter is my enemy. And she is actually fighting me for access to what I perceive as being what I need. In this case, literally relationship with my wife, both physically and also, by the way, narratively. Like in terms of the story, it's like, why? Right, we can actually know we can't maintain a high quality relationship if we can't communicate with each other, right? And so, okay, how do I deal with the fact that my, my basic physical response is building up anger towards this, you know, we call it ruthless, um, fully dedicated and absolutely narcissistic little animal. Um, a whole nother thing, right? Which by the way, is a whole other chunk of deep self stuff. You know, anger and how to deal with anger energy, which is a part of my lineage, a big long story, even down to the epigenetic level, apparently, is another big chunk of my sovereignty frontier. And then, of course, the uh, trauma response of shame around anger, which then creates a down, downward cycle towards sadness and despair and depression and off the, the path that we were speaking about earlier. Those are some that are pretty present in my current environment, but there are many. Oh, man. I mean, all kinds. Um, you know, simple things like alcohol, you know, I even actually, you know, how to come into right relationship with alcohol. And, and I mean, this in a very narrow sense, like it's, how do I get alcohol effectively to zero or very close? Because I just notice that even just one drink causes a down a decrease in my, in the capacities that I believe are appropriate and necessary. And so it's not that I'm and drinking a bottle of scotch a day, it's rather that if I have literally a shot of bourbon, it's something that I don't want. Hmm, interesting. Well, why is that coming up? Oh, interesting. I've bound the notion of jazz to the notion of, uh, of, a, of an old fashioned, a bad habit, right? So those kinds of things. Um, so that, I mean, I can go on ad forever if you'd like. <laughs> the short answer is a lot, uh, but those are some that are, pr are pretty intense and I think also require a um, you know, the species is to propagate, learning how to do this sovereignty practice at the individual, the relational, and then at the family level is, a, is requisite. And we can no longer rely, again, this, this notion of the shift from, from evolutionary basis into a conscious basis, we can no longer rely on our evolved cultural practices as, a, as an architecture to support that sovereignty or that capacity. Um, so it's a, a real challenge of learning how to build self, relational, and then this other thing, family, which is sort of a larger relational manifold. Any quick shares, Justin? How often do you not feel sovereign? Well, over what time frame? Like, do you want me to integrate over the past, say, 10 years? Every or, day, every week, uh, oh, many once times a, a month? Day. Many times a day. Thank you. I feel much better. I, I'm sorry. I, I Thank you. I feel much better. Um, do you have uh, time for one more question, Jordan? Absolutely. Uh, Journey, you had a a question that's pretty relevant to uh, the BSD experience. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, yeah, quite directly to the thesis driving us meeting here, um, how can we leverage small groups to co-build the choice infrastructure? As you just alluded to, we can't rely on culture to provide that uh, uh, sorry, architecture. Mm. So, uh, how can we use small groups to do so in this in the uh, development of virtue? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what I would say is something like we're going to be building culture and in many ways, uh, scaffolding culture. So we can't rely on culture. But we're also not going to throw the damn thing out. Otherwise, we'd be in real trouble. So, how do we do that? What I would say, and this goes back to that notion of virtue as being um, like geometric objects, like almost like the basic building blocks or the tools, uh, the Legos, out of which we build larger, more complicated objects. Cleaning your room, right? Cleaning your room isn't just because you want your room nice. Cleaning your room is a basic replicable 
expression of simple virtue. And there's a simple virtue. So the idea is to be able to identify what are the components, the small components, the basic components, the invariant across a very large number of contexts, and then begin to um, build those as, as dispositions, build habits of, of simple virtue, and then begin to collaborate in larger, more complicated cultural structures founded on these deep integrous habits of simple virtue. So it's, um, you know, imagine that you're beginning to do something like acrobatics, like acrobats in the circus. And let's just say you've decided that's what you're gonna do, but none of you are acrobats, you're just people. Well, you're not gonna begin by flying on the high, high trapeze. You can begin by doing things like building your own physical strength and flexibility. And you're gonna begin by doing things like learning how to trust each other's trust and judgment on the ground, right? So that's the idea. Start at the basic stuff that is necessary to begin the process of getting to the higher levels. And part of it is collaboration. This is why group is the thing, right? You're building your individual and then you're beginning to enter into the relational field. And what we're doing is we're simultaneously discovering the set of virtues and the shape and the definition of them and how they show up in different contexts. And then we're also practicing embodying them as increasingly sophisticated and durable habits so that we can then integrate them into something that becomes a solid foundation from which we can then extend to the next level and then the next level and the next level with more people, more complexity. So pick a project, pick anything, do it. Now do something different with the same group of people. Now do the first thing with a different group of people. See how that works? You're exploring the total phase space of how human beings build cultures, but now consciously, deliberately, intentionally trying to use this whatever wisdom we've developed to support a hmm, not accelerated well yeah accelerated but it's more like more precise and less noisy um, learning of how to go about conscious searching of virtue you ever heard of chess boxing no nah. So, you know, if you're good at chess, you're probably not good at boxing. If you're good at boxing, you're probably not good at chess. Just roughly speaking, you know, world-class boxers, I'm gonna guess for the most part, are not grandmasters in chess. And grandmasters in chess are probably not particularly effective at fisticuffs. What happens if you combine those into a single project? Hmm, interesting. Right? There's a whole new set of capabilities that builds up. Uh, the point there is I did a, you're doing a, uh, what's that called? A, not a bricolage, but an alchemical admixture of different tools saying, hmm, what happens if we begin to combine these? So form a boxing club, form a chess club, and then form a chess boxing club. Oh, by the way, chess boxing is a, is a game that was developed where you play one round of speed chess, and then the bell rings and you shift to one round of boxing, and then you shift back to speed chess, and you iterate back and forth like six or seven times. Um, and notice, and then discuss, how do you get better at this? How do you actually learn, collaborate on learning what's going on on the interior of this, this learning frontier? Any follow-up, uh, Shiraz Chernin? Yeah, I just wanna um, titrate my understanding is it's that we, we just take up more intentional projects with other people and we vary those projects with different groups over time to see how different relational dynamics influence the core project with an orientation towards the foundation so let's say let me take for example the notion of education um at, at around at around 12 10 to 12 uh kids are prepared to begin the process of learning something in the direction of vocation so like think of like a guild like a masonry or, or fishing. But the point at the beginning is not learning how to fish. The point at the beginning is learning how to do things like time management and how to set objectives and how to discipline yourself so that you can do the things necessary to set objectives. What you notice is whether you're building a house or you're fishing, these are basics, yeah? So you, the basics are the key, focus on the basics. All the basics have to be embodied in real things. Otherwise, you're not learning them for real. So do the real thing. 
But notice what you're really doing is you're the learning what the basics are and in learning how to embody the basics in a, in a fundamental capacity, right? You're literally making them part of who you are. So then when you shift domain, what you're noticing is what part of what I thought was the basics was actually just an artifact of the domain that I was in. And what part of it is actually generalizable, universal. Now I'm really beginning to get that, that foundation of the basics really clear and pure and hard. Now I'll expand what's above those basics. Now do I begin to build more facility beyond the level? Because I don't want to be bound. I don't want to be just somebody who gets the basics right. The basics are there to support me in going into larger things more stake, more intensity, more complexity. That's the, that's the thing. Wow. So straightforward. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's simple, not easy, but simple. That was an awesome um, way to end too. Uh, Cause that's essentially what this project is about, you know, embodying the basics, getting right relationship with the basics. Um, so before we close out, Jordan, any parting advice you have for Daniel and I or everyone else here in the room who's committed to this project of uh, cultivating mutual sovereignty? Sure. Um, you know, we had the notion of the meta crisis and to recognize the meta crisis isn't just a thought experiment, right? it's the actual world we're living in. And so be aware of the fact that the context that we're living in is increasing in intensity Right? The ripples are growing. And that while you may feel that you are moving backward, it's actually perhaps you are moving forward as an individual, but the context is getting harder. Right? Very important to keep that in mind. Um, it may very well be that on a day-to-day -day basis, you are quote unquote out of sovereignty more and more and more. It's not because you are failing in growth. You may actually be increasing in growth, but the context may be getting harder and much harder. Just remember that. It's uh, nature is providing us with the ultimate test harness to build our collective sovereignty. Ooh. Awesome. Uh, any uh, uh, parting words uh, for Jordan Daniel uh, on your end? Uh, no, I just kind of got shivers there. Um, made me realize how significant the basics really are. Mm, beautiful um so we're going to close out here uh we're going to bio break play some music anyone who has to slip out feel free to do so um but before we go i just want to give a lot of love and gratitude over to jordan uh the sense making general thank you so much for coming here and uh being a part of this experience with us thanks peter i'm glad that um i said yes when you asked mm -hmm.